Hey everybody, Tony Richway Industries. Today's video, I'm talking about a presentation that we put together a few years ago and thought it would be a good idea to get it posted on YouTube for anyone to check out anytime they'd like. All right, so as you can see on the screen, I'm gonna be talking about cellular concrete and just doing a general overview. Real quick, we're gonna take a look at what cellular concrete is, uses, advantages, production methods, mixed designs, quality control, and then we'll take a look at a couple projects, or at least one in detail. So what is cellular concrete? As defined by ACI 523, it's concrete made with hydraulic cement, water, and preformed foam to form a hardened material having an oven dry density of 50 pounds per cubic foot or less. On the left-hand side of the screen there, you see we've got a couple other ASTM specifications re related to cellular concrete, some uh, which may be related to the testing method for cellular concrete, which is 495. The other two are more related to the foam concentrates used to generate the foam using cellular concrete. Then, of course, in this picture here, that's a section view of a sample of cured cellular concrete. It may be a little difficult to see in the video, um, but it's just designed to give you kind of a, a view of what that bubble structure would look like in a cured sample of material. Overview on uh, some of the uses for cellular concrete. In geotechnical, we have annular space grouting, pipe abandonment, soil stabilization, trench fills, general backfill behind uh, abutments, foundations, void filling, in, again, in general. And the last bullet point here, uh, what we tell people quite often is any place where you might be using flowable fill or need a fill of any type, even if it's a granular compacted fill, cellular concrete is a great alternative for those applications. And then building construction uses, roof decks, floor decks, uh, precast blocks and walls, ballistic blocks and panels, and energy absorbing crash barriers. Um, these uses on both geotech and the building construction are kind of a general overview again, and uh, there are a few other applications out there um, that don't that aren't listed, and I'm sure uh, many other applications to come. So we're going to take a little closer look at a few of the more popular applications, starting with some of the geotech and infrastructure uses, annular space filling and pipe abandonment. Um, both of these applications are extremely common with a lot of our existing customers and throughout the U.S. as a whole, uh, and really North America, I guess I should say. Uh, a couple of the advantages. Um, in annular space grouting, which of course we've got a, a picture of there, uh, one of the big advantages of say like angry is it reduces buoyancy and uplift on the liner pipe, so you've got less chance of floating it. And then uh, more applicably to pipe abandonment, and I guess a annular grouting as well, Cellular concrete can be pumped extreme distances. Uh, it's very common for cellular concrete to be pumped thousands of feet from one location. So, uh, again, that's an extreme advantage of cellular concrete for this particular application, something you won't find with uh, many of any other materials. General void filling. Uh, in these photos here, we've got a uh, floor here that, uh, if you can't really tell, had collapsed. A contractor cut a few floor, uh, holes in the floor and we simply pumped cellular concrete in um, and this is the after photo. Cellular concrete was able to move throughout all the voids and completely fill in that slab up. Uh, so general, general void filling advantages are of course it flows easily uh, and secondly it does not require, require compaction. Soil stabilization and subgrade fill um, creates a strong lightweight base in poor soils, uh, speeds construction, reduces lateral loads on surrounding structures. In this particular case, um, there were some um, seismic assessments done on what you can't see is a, a railroad going under an overpass here. Uh, so it was required that some of the material be taken out and filled back in with cellular concrete just to reduce the uh, load. Um, on the lateral structure of the overpass. Taking a look at a couple of the more popular building construction uses, roof decks, floor decks, and floor toppings uh, creates an insulative weather resistant membrane if you're on a roof, uh, decreases dead loads, which is of course applicable to floor toppings as well. These two photos show a project in which we were 
on site with a contractor. They were doing about 4,000 yards of a lightweight fill on um, an old building that was being rehabbed. And of course, it was they needed to get the floor all leveled out, but keep the dead load reduced. So cellular concrete was a great material choice here. And then after which they top coated everything with about, I want to say an inch and a half of a quote unquote normal lightweight concrete. Precast blocks and walls. Uh, the advantages are it's fireproof, thermal and sound insulation are increased. It's economical and easy to handle. This photo shows some homes being built in Haiti. We worked with a nonprofit that was uh, uh, building some homes down there. And as you can see, they were using precast cellular concrete blocks to build these homes. Uh, one of the things I'd like to point out, uh, in the US, building of homes and structures with cellular concrete uh, blocks and panels is not very common. However, it's so common outside of the US that uh, Stanley Hand Tools actually makes a hand saw that is designed specifically for cutting cellular concrete blocks and panels on job sites. Production methods. Now, there are two production methods that we talk about, the batch production method and the continuous production method. The batch production method is the simpler of the two. In that method, you would just uh, require a foam generator, which is, uh, as you see there in that photo, and you would simply batch foam, as you see in this photo, into, in this case, a ready mix truck or any type of mixer you may have. Uh, with this method, any density is possible. It's just a function of how much foam you add into the mix. Um, the disadvantage is typically because cellular concrete does require pumping to the point of placement, uh, you would also need a pump uh, to get the material pumped after it's mixed up. With this particular machine here, our CFVT20C, you can achieve about 30 yards an hour of production uh, capacity. The second production method, as I mentioned, is the continuous production method. Uh, here's a photo of a CT100D. Um, of course, this machine does have an integrated uh, pump, which uh, is a little close up here. And instead of introducing the foam into the ready mix truck, we're actually injecting the foam on the discharge side of the pump there. Uh, a couple of advantage, advantages with this production method. With our machine, of course, we have a uh, pump integrated into it, so you've got that capability. Uh, we also reduce lo the logistics because we can bring out a full truckload of slurry with this production method, say typically seven, eight yards uh, of slurry that you can haul, and then we're injecting that foam in line on the discharge side of the pump. So we're gonna take that eight yards of material and turn that into 25 to 30 yards of cellular concrete if you're around that 30 pound per cubic foot range, which uh, is a, kind of the, uh, go-to density for a lot of geotech void fill type applications. Um, and of course, this machine here is rated up to 100 yards an hour of production capacity, and that is at 30 PCF. All right, so talking about mix designs, um, we kind of discuss mix designs with uh, two things in mind. The base slurry, which is the mix before we've added foam and then the silo concrete slurry. So it's very typical for a base slurry mix design to be just a neat cement slurry, which is just Portland water having anywhere between a 0.4 and 0.8 water cement ratio. However, flash, slag, other cementitious materials may be used as well. Coarse and fine aggregates are typically not used. And the reason that is with inside the concrete, those are going to detract from the strength. And as you probably already know, cellular concrete, as it gets lighter in weight, does become weaker in strength. So anything you can do to keep your strength as high as possible is, of course, desirable. So taking all of your aggregates out, your sands and your, your rock, and replacing that or keeping your Portland content as high as possible is the way we achieve that. Um, batch weights, if we were going to make one yard of neat, or the base slurry without foam, and for a 0.5 water cement ratio, that would consist of about 2,000 pounds of Portland and 1,000 pounds of water. Now the cellular slurry mix design, of course that's after we've added foam, is typically specified by the density and compressive strength. And as I mentioned, uh, as density increases, so does strength. To produce one yard of 30 pound per cubic foot material, we're gonna take one yard of base slurry and add approximately 2.5 yards of, of foam. 
And then down here at the bottom, we've just got a, a couple things touching on varying densities and corresponding strengths. So for a 30 pound per, per cubic foot material, you can expect somewhere uh, in between a 100 and 150 PSI strength range. And then if we jump all the way up to 80 pounds per cubic foot, you can achieve 1500 to 2000 PSI of compressive strength. So something that we have available on our website is our, our cellular concrete mix design calculator. This is just an Excel uh, spreadsheet based um, program that anyone can download free of charge. But it basically allows you to set up your batch, or excuse me, your mix design so you can determine batch amounts. You can, with this, set if you want to use aggregates, uh, sands, uh, determine your cellular concrete volume, set your um, cellular concrete weight, gives you the, the control and flexibility to really uh, adjust any parameter to your mix uh, and determine your batch weights required for your base slurry uh, and then determine materials required for any given cellular concrete um, that you need to produce as well. And then on the right hand side, it will provide you information such as how much foam concentrate you're going to need to produce whatever you have in batch side you set, how much water you may need, and then it also does some cost analysis. So again, it's a very uh, helpful tool for determining a whole host of things that you may need to be looking at if you're looking at using cellular concrete uh, on any given project. All right, so quality control. Uh, with cellular concrete, of course, quality control is an, an important component, uh, which also is, of course, true of anything that you're going to be doing or producing. So three key components to quality cellular concrete. Equipment that's designed for producing and placing cellular concrete. What we're talking about here is the foam generation equipment. Uh, having foam generation equipment is, that is designed to produce a small, consistent bubble structure is extremely important. Another component to consider is the pump uh, that you may use, assuming you're pumping it to the point of placement. A wide variety of pumps can be used, but the uh, condition of the pump and the style of pump will have an effect on whether you have whether or not you have any density change issues as you're pumping the material. Second thing is foam concentrate design for producing cellular concrete and is ASTM 869 certified. I often tell people you could take palm olive dish soap, run it through one of our machines, it's going to make great looking foam. If you tried to introduce that into a slurry and make cellular concrete with it, uh, you're not going to have good success. So it is very important that you're using a foam it's really designed to withstand the production process all the way from the mixing through pumping and the set of the material. Last thing is well prepared slurry. Uh, you could have the best foam generation equipment, top of the line foam, you name it. Your slurry isn't mixed well and by that we mean if the Portland isn't thoroughly mixed and um, doesn't have any agglomerations or Portland balls in it, that would be an indicator of poorly mixed uh, slurry then you're going to have a cellular concrete that does not perform well. So it is very critical that you use a well-prepared slurry. One other thing I would mention uh, to that uh, is having fresh Portland. If you go to a big box store and you get a bag of Portland that's been sitting there for you know, three weeks, three months, uh, I guess I'd, it would kind of depend on humidity levels, but that material will begin to slowly hydrate over time. And if it's too old, even if it looks and appears to mix up well, uh, you can have a cellular concrete that, that doesn't perform. It may not even set up, or if it does set up, you'll have significant volume loss. So just remember that using fresh Portland is very important. So density of cellular concrete, of course, is uh, extremely important in ensuring you've got a good quality material. Because we've already mentioned, and you already know, that density is strongly correlated with strength, uh, checking your density is extremely important. That's kind of the be-all, end-all uh, of QC with cellular concrete. And we tell people you want to measure that density as close to the point of placement when you're producing cellular concrete because if you've got any variations due to your pump style, pump condition, any other things going on, uh, you're going to have had a chance for all of those things to affect the material the further out on your, on your system it is. So checking it to the uh, point of close, to the point closest to placement is going to be the best way to ensure that you've uh, accounted for any issues like that. So taking a look at a project, this is something we did a couple years ago. It was a water, bain, water main abandonment. It was a 16 inch water main. It was 2100 feet in length. Uh, we counted out that it was going to take around 110 yards of 40 PCF 
material. The mix design we chose was, um, of course, a neat cement slurry with a 0.6 water cement, water cement ratio. And as I mentioned, we were going to foam that down to 40 pounds per cubic foot. We needed to be able to pump this the full distance, the full 2,100 feet from one port on the low end of the pipe. And, and the low end of the pipe is the uh, preferred uh, port to be pumping from on any time you're doing something like this. Uh, because of uh, our production demands at the time, we did not have any of our own machines available. So we rented a CT30D back from one of our customers, and which you see there in that photo. And then one of the other things is, and I just kind of mentioned as far as quality control, we set up our density sampling T here, and this was right at the injection port of the, again, on the low end of the pipe. A little difficult to see in the video, but we, the way we set this T up is we've got our line coming off our pump, comes in here, we've got a T with a ball valve set up there. So when we want to uh, sample material, we'd simply open that ball valve and into a five gallon bucket to pull our sample from. Uh, one thing is too, when sampling material, we tell people use a ball valve that's equal to your pump line size. And when you open that up, open it up all the way. Uh, if you only open part, part of the way, you're gonna have issues in, um, getting an accurate sample. So the results, uh, the calculated volume meant that it would take nearly four hours to fill with using a CT30D. Uh, we typically tell people three hours is about all the longer you want to take to be pumping on uh, cellular concrete, I'm moving it. And so we knew that we were going to be pushing the time. And at four hours and 15 minutes, we calculated we had 110 yards of Material in the pipe, but it was still not full. Uh, so we ordered another five yards of slurry to try finishing the project. Uh, by the time it showed up and we got back to pumping, we were about five hours and 15 minutes into, the, into it after the first material was placed. We were able to get material to continue being pumped in, but it was no longer pushing the flow. And we could tell that because uh, the vent pipe on the high end, there was no air coming out. That's a good indicator of whether or not your pipe is actually filling up. So after discussing the situation with the inspector, kind of going through the calcs in terms of how much material we'd put in, how far we thought it got in the pipe, uh, he was satisfied with the results uh, and we were able to call the job complete. Uh, and the big thing is, the big takeaway I guess is on this, um, with cellular concrete, time is critical and you've got a limited amount of time that you can uh, place the material before you, do, you need to just let it get a set. And of course, this was case in point. Um, in, in that again. And although we didn't have much choice uh, given the equipment we had available and the timing of the project, uh, we were fortunate enough to have uh, an inspector who was wor willing to work with us and allow us to, to call that job complete. Okay, that wraps it up. Appreciate you taking your time.